so close, but so far. Yes, the Laval Rockets season may have come to an end this past weekend, but there are some really positive things to take from this year, and we're going to get into those today. We can certainly say it right out of the gate. This season did not go for the Laval Rocket the way a lot of their fans and the team themselves would have liked it to, perhaps expected it to, and they certainly put up a good fight down the stretch. Uh, it came so close. In fact, it really, truly came down to the final two games of the season. We're going to talk about those two games in just a moment, discuss how the season ended and how things went down last weekend against the Belleville Senators. But then I want to shift focus to a more positive aspect of what can we take from maybe not quite the most successful season for the Montreal Canadiens AHL affiliate, but what are the positive things that we can take away and build on and look forward to in the coming months? and certainly next year. After an entire season and a lot of recent weeks of nail-biting, edge of the seat, watching every single game going in the North Division to see who got points, who didn't, who got who moved up, who didn't, what's the magic number, it all came down to two games last week for the Laval Rocket, both against the Belleville Senators. Remember, Belleville had a game in hand left on Laval on Wednesday night, and they actually won that game on Wednesday night. And so that put them four points ahead of Laval going into Friday and Saturday's two-game home-and-home series uh, to wrap up the regular season. So Laval was sitting in sixth place, four points behind Belleville, and that meant Laval had to win both games in regulation in order to tie Belleville and Laval, because they had more regulation wins on the season, would then win the tiebreaker and earn that fifth position, that final spot, to qualify for the playoffs and the best of three play-in round. Laval started this series, uh, this home-and-home -home series, on the road in Belleville, and I think this probably worked to Belleville's favor because we know what the crowds in Laval have been like. It is a hostile barn to come into, particularly for division rivals in big games, and it can be pretty uh, intimidating and distracting for visiting teams. But for Laval to start in Belleville, it's a smaller arena, um, and so it's qu it's a little bit quieter. Um, doesn't mean to say at all that Belleville's fans aren't just as passionate about their team, because they are. But it certainly gave Belleville a little bit of an advantage, but you wouldn't necessarily know that at the start of this game with everything on the line. If Belleville could even get one point, if they could force overtime in that Friday night game, that would basically be it for Laval. They would eliminate Laval. So Belleville was looking to clinch a playoff berth. Laval was looking to save their season and have it all come down to Saturday night's game. To their credit, Laval had a lot of rookies in the lineup on this night. Uh, Luke Tuck coming in to make his debut. Uh, David Reinbacher, of course, was in the lineup. Florian Jackye was in the lineup. Uh, also, don't forget, Jaden Struble had been sent back. Justin Barron had been sent back from Montreal. Joshua Waugh had been sent back and cleared to play. Uh, lots of reinforcements that had come down from Montreal. Uh, and so... There was a good contingent of, of players available in this game, and it was Laval who actually scored first. Mitchell Stevens, back on the ice from injury, got the first goal of the game in the first period, and that did a lot for Laval's bench. And it seemed to almost set Belleville back on their heels a little bit because they really struggled to get anything going in the first period. And in fact, Laval extended their lead in the second period when Leas Anderson potted a goal that put Laval up two to nothing in the second period. And I think there were a lot of fans on Laval's side who thought, oh, they've got this in the bag. And a lot on the Belleville side thinking, uh oh, this is not going to end well. For Belleville to try to mount a two goal comeback um, against a surging Laval team, typically within these two teams, has not usually been successful. 
But not long after Leas Anderson scored that goal, Wyatt Bongiovanni got one back for Belleville. And that something about that goal shifted everything in Belleville's favor. And the momentum shifted into Belleville's favor. But both teams kept battling. And there wasn't a whole lot going on. There weren't getting a ton of chances at either end of the ice. This went into the third period with Laval still up 2-1, to one, clinging to the hope that they could just maintain at least that one goal lead and live to fight another day back on home ice on Saturday night. But as has happened for the entire season, penalties kept getting Laval in trouble. In fact, Joshua Waugh was the first one to get a penalty in this game in the first period for a, a, che- a, a illegal check to the head. He would then be suspended by the league for that incident, and he did not play on Saturday night's game because he was serving his suspension. But Laval kept finding themselves in the penalty box, and late in the third period, Mitchell Stevens took a delay of game penalty. And despite the fact that Belleville had been completely unsuccessful on the power play four other times <laughs> during the course of this game, only one of them really mattered. And Igor Sokolov managed to tie the game with about five minutes left in the third off that power play because Mitchell Stevens took that delay of game penalty. Well, now the battle was really on because Belleville could taste it. Remember, I said they only needed to get one point. They just needed to force overtime to put Laval out of playoff contention. Laval had to win this game in regulation. In fact, it was so important and so vital for Laval to win this game in regulation. J.F. Uhl pulled Jakob Dobesh, even though the score was tied a lot of a lot of Belleville fans, a lot of fans in general were, th- were were saying, what is going on? Why would the coach pull your goaltender when the game was tied? Well, because overtime didn't mean anything to Laval. They had to win in regulation. Laval was trying everything they could, but honestly, Belleville, they were like hungry sharks smelling blood in the water. They smothered Laval. Laval only had six shots on goal in the third period. And then the unthinkable happened. With Dobesh pulled, Laval was trying everything they could to score a goal, win the game before it went to overtime. Puck got loose. Both teams scrambling down towards Laval's net. Looked like Belleville missed their opportunity to pot the empty netter with one second left on the clock. Sokolov snuck in an empty netter with one second second left on the clock and in that second Belleville punched their ticket to the playoffs and Laval's season was over. In fact the recap article that I wrote on the hockey news was titled Laval Rocket season decided in the final second and yes it was decided in the final second but they lost the game when Mitchell Stevens took that penalty for delay of game And they allowed that power play goal with five minutes left. That decided their season, really. That's when they lost the game. And penalties had been a story for this team from the very beginning of the season. And it really is what ended up sinking them in the end. So that meant that Laval knew coming home on Saturday night for their final game of the season that there really wasn't anything for them to play for but pride. Like I said, the crowds at Place Bell this season have been absolutely incredible, so supportive of their team. And so, yes, it would be a a meaningless game in terms of the playoffs or the standings, but it would be a way to properly close the season for their fans and thank their fans for all of their support. Belleville, while they were obviously going to rest some guys to get ready for the playoffs, would still be playing to get home ice advantage. So Belleville wasn't going to just roll over and kind of phone it in on Saturday night. I'm disappointed to say that Laval didn't seem to try very hard on Saturday. I would have liked to have seen this group come out with a better mentality of you know, we didn't win last night, our season is ending after tonight, But the fact that we were even in the playoff conversation after the miserable start to the season, which quite frankly, come December, they didn't deserve to be in the playoff conversation, but they fought back and they had a lot to be proud of. Instead, 
Uh, some of the rookies were were not playing. Uh, apparently, minor injuries to David Reinbacher, Jaden Struble. Guys like Riley McKay got back in the lineup. Riley McKay earned himself a game misconduct in the opening two minutes of the game because he decided to just start literally punching guys in the face for no apparent reason and unprovoked. So he got tossed within the first couple of minutes of the game. Uh, and things just kind of continued to devolve from there. Um, it seemed that Laval, instead of taking the high road, just wanted to kind of get their licks in uh, at the end of the season. And I found that very disappointing. Uh, they also didn't seem to be trying very hard. And in fact, it Belleville ended up beating them again on home ice. How often did that happen this season, that Laval would lose on home ice, particularly to Belleville? The game started similarly. William Trudeau was the one who scored the first goal of the game in the first period, put Laval up one to nothing. Neither team scored in the second. There was, you know, some more penalties in the second. But in the third, uh, Belleville was able to tie the game very early in the third period. And a couple of minutes later, uh, actually got a go-ahead goal on, oh, a power play. And that was going to be it. Uh, once Belleville got ahead in that game, it's almost like Laval just gave up at that point and just got really testy and frustrated and... That's basically what you got for the rest of the game. So with that, Laval's season uh, did come to an end. They had their end of season exit interviews the very next day. Kind of your run-of-the-mill interviews. The big question really is J.F. Uhl's contract is now up at the end of this season. And so it is not yet determined as to whether or not the Canadians will extend him or not. Uh, according to J.F. Uhl, they haven't begun those discussions yet. Um, it will be interesting to see if they sign J.F. Uhl for a new contract or not, uh, or if Kent Hughes and company will decide that they'd like to bring uh, someone of their own in to coach the AHL franchise, keeping in mind, of course, that J.F. Uhl is one of the only, J.F. Uhl and his assistants are, are some of the only pieces left from the previous administration that Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon did not change when they came into the organ to the Montreal Canadiens organization. So it is Belleville who is going to be playing Toronto for the best of three play in round in the North division. Um, the winner of that series will go on to play the Cleveland monsters in the semifinals. The other semifinal matchup will be Rochester versus Syracuse. But I don't want to be Debbie Downer today because there's actually a lot of really positive things to take from this season in Laval. You know, at the start of this season, we put out a lot of viewer warnings. This is going to be a young team and the focus is supposed to be on development. So don't expect them to make the playoffs. Don't expect them to do wonderful things. Now, granted, they had more of a rough start than I think even I was expecting uh, but a lot of that just had to do with the off-season personnel choices for some of the veteran placements on the team. And I was very vocal about that at the beginning of the season as well, that I didn't think that they made great signing choices uh, of more experienced players at the beginning of the at the beginning of the season and over the summer. So I'm not exactly upset that they didn't make the playoffs because I'm more pleased to see that, there are rookies and prospects on this team who made some really serious strides forward in their development this year. And that is the purpose of the AHL team, to start to shape the next generation of the Montreal Canadiens so that the, the Canadians can continue their rebuild and eventually compete for a Stanley Cup. And there are some of the guys that played on this team this year who are going to be a part of that at some point. Jakob Dobish is one of those. We're going to talk about him in a moment. Logan Mayu absolutely is going to be part of that puzzle as well. Joshua Waugh, we will see how he uh, works out. But we've also got prospects like Sean Farrell, Riley Kidney, uh, Jared Davidson. Jaden Struble spent most of his season in the, N N in the NHL this year. Uh, David Reinbacher has just joined uh, the team as well. Luke Tuck just getting there. Florian Jacki just getting there. Uh, there are a lot of positive things to take away. If we think back way to the beginning of the 2023-24 season, goaltending was shaky at best. 
not through the fault of Jakob Dobish. It was his rookie campaign needed some time to settle in and adjust to the AHL slash pro game. But the tandem that he had working with him, Strauss Mann, had spent most of his previous year in the ECHL, not really the guy who could be depended on to stabilize things in the crease while Dobesh made that transition over the course of a few months. And you'll also remember, if you've been watching our channel for a while, that back at the beginning of the season, I had said I was not confident that Strauss Mann was the correct choice for the Laval Rocket and it turned out that really it was not the way for the team's management to go in selecting Strauss Mann. And in fact, most of the rest of the season, once they signed Casimir Kaskasuo to a PTO, Strauss Mann uh, occasionally spent some time with Laval in terms of just being a third goaltender in practice and so forth, but he spent most of the rest of his season back down in the ECHL with the Trois Rivières Lions. And so we saw almost an immediate shift in Jakob Dobish. Once there was a guy who they could depend on to really carry more of the weight of responsibility in the crease with Kaskasuo coming in on a PTO, Dobesh was able to focus on what he needed to focus on and not try to go out and save the team every night. And that was really the beginning of really positive movement for Jakob Dobish. Goaltending is one of the most difficult and lengthy positions to develop in hockey. And we saw Jakob Dobish make some really incredible strides in that area this season. In fact, he suited up for 51 of Laval's 72 games this season. He ended the year with a 24-18-6 and record with one shutout in there as well. His goals against average was 2.93, and his save percentage was a 9.06. That's pretty admirable when you look at how this season started for Jakob Dobish and the Laval Rocket. That is a commendable way to wrap up the season, and I think that next year in his sophomore campaign, I think we're going to see him make some pretty incredible strides. And as long as they have a solid experienced goaltender in tandem with him. I don't know that it will be Casimir Kaskasuo, but as long as they have someone who's a good mentor, who is stable in the net and can provide that support, I think Jakob Dobish is going to do some really good things for his development next year. Okay, next we have to look at Logan Mayu. Logan Mayu actually made one of the AHL All-Star teams for the end of the season. We have talked about him in previous videos that he just absolutely decimated the competition in terms of rookie defensemen and, and at times during the season, AHL defensemen overall. Logan Mayu ended up, uh, he was the only guy on the team who played all 72 games. He is the only guy on the team who didn't miss a game. And in those 72 games played 14 goals, 33 assists for 47 points. Um, he did an incredible job, and he is going to be one of the defensemen who's going to be battling for a spot on the Canadiens roster come training camp in the fall. Um, Joshua Waugh spent a little bit of time up with the Canadians. I think he still has some developing to do, but in his 41 games played in the AHL, 13 goals and 19 assists for 32 points. Sean Farrell actually ended up having a pretty decent season, despite the fact that he missed a bit of time due to injury. Nine goals and 19 assists in 47 games played. Not too shabby for Sean Farrell. I think he made some really positive steps forward. I'd like to see Riley Kidney break out a little bit more, but I think uh, perhaps with another season, he might be able to grow his game a little bit. He's one that I'm not sure is going to make the jump to the NHL. We, we have to wait to see. Uh, but he had seven goals and 13 assists on the season. Uh, Jared Davidson was doing well before his injury. 11 goals and five assists on the season for Jared Davidson. And we know Jaden Struble spent most of the season up with the Canadians. David Reinbacher, that's going to be, those are going to be the big question marks. David Reinbacher, Florian Jacki, Luke Tuck. 
Uh, Reinbacher probably will need to spend some time in the AHL next year. I don't know that he's, I think he's going to try to compete for a spot in the NHL in the fall. I don't know that he's going to get one. And I've said that before. I said that I think it's more likely that he starts in Laval next year and then does kind of what Jaden Struble did, which is then get called up early in the season. And if he transitions well, he might find himself staying up for the rest of the season. Luke talk is going to be interesting. Luke Tuck only got to play two games, and they were two games that Laval lost. But Luke Tuck really showed some promise. And I will be really eager to see how he does at the start of the season next year, you know, preseason, the rookie camp. I think that he's going to have a strong year. I think he'll spend a decent amount of time in the AHL because he hasn't really played pro hockey much at all. That's just two games. But I think there could be a a promising forward there in Luke Tuck. And so I will be really, really eager to see how he does. There's a lot of excitement and a lot of fun things that happened with Laval this season, despite the fact that, you know, there were a lot of tough nights, a lot of tough losses, and that they didn't make the playoffs. That's kind of all beside the point. It's it stinks. I know that. But that's all kind of beside the point. The The focus and where we should feel good is that there was some positive development that took place. And I think with the right people around them, the right veterans in that locker room, I think they could make some even bigger strides next year. Here's what I don't want you to do, though. I don't want you to think that just because Laval's season is over means that we are going away here on the channel, both here on the Rocket Hockey Report, the Canadians Connection podcast, my Habs Hockey Report that usually comes out on Thursdays. None of that is going away all summer long. Unlike most other channels that kind of take the off season off, we don't do that here at Rocket Sports. So if you've not done so already, tap that subscribe button. We are going to be back every week with fresh content because there's actually a lot of things that are going to be really fun to talk about with the Canadians and their prospects over the coming weeks and the coming months, and you're not going to want to miss a bit of it. And so today you heard kind of my breakdown of how the Laval Rockets season ended, but what about those Montreal Canadiens? Well, Rick and Michael handed out their end of season grades, but also gave uh, some optimistic outlooks for what's ahead for the Canadians in this off season and next year coming up. They did that on the latest Canadians Connection episode. You can check it out right here on this video, and I'll see you again next time.